In this lecture, I want to look at a nonlinear box model, and the one I will look at is um, the two-box model for the thermohaline circulation that was first proposed by Hen Henry Stommel. And uh, because the equations are nonlinear, this model is interesting because it produces a multiple steady-state equilibrium in certain parameter ranges, and whether which uh, steady state the model goes to will depend on the initial condition. And so, the, as I said, the original model is due to Stommel, but the particular formulation I'm going to work with is the one based on the paper by Palachesi that appeared in the Journal of Physical Oceanography in 1994. So a simple box model for stochastically forced thermohaline flow. So we have two boxes. And box one represents the low latitude ocean. Whereas box two represents the high latitude ocean. For simplicity, we're going to assume that both boxes have the same volume and the same mean depth or thickness. H is the same for both boxes. You can think of this as the surface. And we divide up the ocean such that there's an equal volume in the high latitudes as the low latitudes. And then the mean temperature and salinity of the boxes, T0 and S0. So this will be temperature and salinity. And then in box one, we'll have T1 and S1 and S1 will be the anomalies of temperature and salinity, so the deviations from T0. And similarly, from box 2, we'll have T2 and S2 will be the anomalies or the deviations from S0. So if you want to get back the salinity in box 2, you would add S2 to S0. To get back the salinity in box 1, you would add S1 to S0. So these are, are meant to be anomalies. So T1 and T2 are anomalies are deviations from T0 and some of S1 and S2. And to first set up the equations, we're going to assume that uh, at first that there is no exchange of heat or salt between the boxes. Now, later on, we'll of course want to add some exchanges between the box, but just to take it step by step in the formulation of the model, let's assume that there is no such exchange. Then in box one, we're going to have the following forcing, dt1, dt, and we're going to assume that the heating through the surface tries to make this uh, box warmer than the global mean by an amount theta over 2. And so there'll be a, some relaxation time scale t sub r by which t1 gets restored back to a value of theta over 2. So you can see if, if t1 is greater than theta over 2, this will be a negative term, which will tend to make T1 decrease. Whereas if T1 is less than theta over 2, this will be negative. Negative and negative will make it a plus, will cause T1 to increase until it reaches theta over 2. So, and the time scale at which this will happen is T sub r. Uh, perhaps you can remember what the form of the solution will be. You can write it over here as an aside. Right, so far, for this simple model, we have T1 of T is going to be t1 at time 0 times e to the minus t over t sub r. That takes care of the homogeneous part of the solution. And then the particular one that satisfies the forcing plus 1 minus e to the minus t over tr times theta over 2. So at times 0, the exponential terms both give 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0, this term goes away, and we're just left with t1 of 0, which is the initial condition. And then as time goes on, as t goes towards infinity, um, or once t becomes a few multiples of the relaxation time, t sub r, then this term decays away to 0, this term decays away to 0, and we're just left with theta over 2. So that t1 will be warmer than the global mean by an amount theta over 2. And we'll have the same form of the equation for box 2, t2 dt equals minus 1 over t sub r, t2 minus, but this time the restoring will be towards minus theta over 2. So minus minus will make it a plus theta over 2. So in other words, t2 is gets restored back towards minus theta over 2, and that way um, the global mean 
at steady state will be back to T naught because T1 and T2 will average to zero. So write the solution. This one, T2 of T is going to be T2 of zero e to the minus T over TR plus one minus e to the minus T over TR times minus theta over two. So this is the solution to these equations, which would be the governing equation for the temperature if both boxes were isolated. So what we can see here, there's a thermal forcing that tries to establish a, a gradient between the boxes of a value of theta, right? So this one will be warmer by theta over two, and this one will be colder by theta over two, so the difference will be of round of order theta. So theta here, you can think of it as theta is the thermal gradient or temperature gradient, let's just say temperature gradient, gradient at steady state. So the forcing tries to establish this temperature gradient theta. Now for the salinity in box one and box two, we're going to imagine that there's a freshwater forcing F of T. And if for the present atmosphere, there's since there's extra heating, there's tends to be more evaporation in low latitudes than precipitation. So the low latitudes have excess evaporation over precipitation. And the converse is true for the high latitude box. There's excess precipitation over evaporation. So we have the interesting situation in which here, the uh, freshwater fluxes try to make the low latitude box saltier and therefore denser, while the fluxes at high latitude try to make it fresher and therefore less dense. And the converse is true for the temperature. The warm latitudes gets warmer, therefore less dense, whereas the high latitude gets colder and more dense. So there's competing effects on the density from the thermal forcing and the haline forcing which is what's going to lead to the possibility of having multiple equilibria. So for the same forcing, we'll, might, we can get different uh, solutions depending on the parameter regime. So the equation that we write for the salinity is going to be the following. Oh, I should, actually, we divide those by two. So F of T is sort of the freshwater forcing, uh, the gradient on the freshwater. So the two is there just for convenience d by dt of s1 is equal to so this freshwater forcing here it will have units of let's say um, millimeters per day or something or meters per year and so we to give it a units of time we need to divide by h so it'll depend on the mean depth of the ocean if the ocean is very deep then um, the salinity will change slowly. But if H is very shallow, then clearly it's a small volume that for the same freshwater flux will tend to make the water saltier more quickly. Whereas NS naught here is the mean um, salinity of the ocean. So the effect is to try to, as if F is positive, which we think it is, then this is gonna to try to increase the salinity of box one and decrease it in box two dt is equal to minus f of t over 2h times s naught. So we can see that if we add box 1 and box 2 together, there is no net forcing, right? The sum, notice that d by dt of s1 plus s2 is equal to 0. So the freshwater forcing cannot change the overall salinity of the ocean. So the total salinity is conserved. What the freshwater budget does is it tends to concentrate the salt in the low latitude box and dilute it in the high latitude box. So in this equation here, there is no steady state. So that if I try to solve for this equation uh, for a steady state solution, if I said ddt to zero, ds1 dt to zero, the only way to get a steady state is if f is zero. That's because there's no exchange between the boxes. Later on, when we allow for exchange, we'll be able to have a freshwater forcing that tries to make this one saltier, but then the circulation will try to erode this salinity gradient between the boxes.
All right, so that's the setup so far um, with no exchange of water between the boxes. And now we'll assume that there is some exchange. So there's gonna be a flow. We're gonna pick the sign so that there's an exchange of Q over two from box one to box two, and then the return flow, equal and opposite, Q over two. So this would be the sign of the present um, overturning circulation. In the North Atlantic, for example, surface currents flow north, the water sinks and returns back southward. Um, if we had a circulation that went the other way, we can flip the sign, Q could be negative, and then the flow would go the other way around. We'd have a surface current flowing south, sinking and then flowing back north at depth. So the upshot is that this current here, minus Q over two, is gonna remove, uh, is gonna carry a temperature anomaly T1 out of box one. So the, the water flowing from box one to box two at temperature T1 is going to carry temperature out, so that's why we have the minus, whereas box two is going to carry temperature two into box one. So we'll have a minus here also for T2. So the minus minus will make it a plus, which will be in accord with the water flowing from box two to box one at depth from this term. Another way to view it is that the flow, this mixing between the boxes, tries to erode the temperature gradient. So the bigger the flow is, the smaller the temperature gradient will be between the boxes. So Q, the flow, tries to mix the temperature and make them go back to zero. And then for the high latitude box, we'll have plus Q over two, T1 minus T2. So the same idea, now what flowed out of box one into box two is now a source, right? Which was a loss term minus Q over two T1 was the loss of temperature from box one, now becomes a gain in box two. And in the same way, what was a loss, what is a loss from box two, minus Q over two times T2 is a source in box two, plus Q over two times T2. And the same formula applies, but now for salinity, I want this to be a minus. Minus Q over two, S1 minus S2 plus Q over two, S1 minus S2. And you notice if you add these two equations together, this term cancels, right? So this, this term generates no heat, right? It just redistributes the heat between the boxes. So if I add the two equations, I get the following D by DT, T1 plus T2 is equal to and now the theta over two term cancels because it has an opposite sign. So I'll be left with minus one over T sub R, the relaxation time of T1 plus T2. And the transport term, the Q term, there's opposite sign, it also cancels. So the total temperature, T total, defined as T1 plus T2, its solution will be the following. So it relaxes back to zero with the time scale TR, the total temperature. And for the salt, D by DT, if I add the two equations, I get S1 plus S2. And this time the freshwater forcing cancels and also the mixing term where the exchange rate between the boxes also cancels. So I just get zero. So the total salt, which is S1 plus S2, as the following solution is just equal to a constant, which I will just pick to be zero. All right, so what's left to do now is a specify Q, this exchange of water between the boxes. And the simplest case is to assume that Q is just um, some diffusive time scale. So the temperature anomalies diffuse away with the time scale TD. 
Now that's, um, that's one possibility and it would make the model linear and very simple. Uh, the more interesting case is where the exchange of water between the boxes depends on the density differences between the boxes. So there'll be a thermohaline flow that will be stronger if the density gradient is bigger. So to this we'll add an exchange, Q which is a flow of volume per unit time, divided by the volume will give it a characteristic time scale, and we'll scale this by the square of the density difference between the boxes, where delta rho is equal to rho 2 minus rho 1 is the density difference between the boxes. And so we need some way to compute density uh, in the boxes or the density difference to the temperature and salinity in the boxes. And for that, we'll use a simple linear equation of state. So rho is equal to rho naught times one plus a haline expansion coefficient, S minus S naught minus alpha T, a thermal expansion coefficient, T minus T naught. So if S is greater than S0, alpha S is positive, rho will be greater than rho naught. So an anomaly, a positive anomaly in salinity will tend to increase the density. And for the temperature, if there's a positive temperature, temperature anomaly, there's a negative, alpha T is positive, the thermal expansion coefficient will tend to make the density less than rho naught because of the negative sign. And so rho one, for example, will be rho naught times one. And that would complete the model. Um, now we've already seen that the solutions to the total temperature and the total salinity are uh, very simple, but not particularly interesting because the, the, total, the density difference, delta rho, right, is going to be, is rho two minus rho one. So if I take this difference, I'll get rho naught minus rho naught, so the ones cancel. And then here the S naughts cancel. So this will be rho naught times alpha S, S2 minus S1, minus, so put a parenthesis, alpha T, T2 minus T1. And so the density difference between the boxes depends only on the salinity difference and the temperature difference. And so if I go back to my original equations and I take the difference between box one and box two, the temperature equations and the salinity equations, I can get equations that don't depend on T1 and T2 separately, but they depend only on their differences. And I'll get two equations in two unknowns, one equation for the temperature difference between the boxes and one equation for the salinity difference between the boxes. So let's do this right now, take the difference. So the difference D by DT, and let me pick the same sign as in the paper by Chessy. Uh, they have it the other way than I do. So let me correct this here. Over here, just so that if we go back and we check, they define delta rho to be rho one minus rho two. And so over here, this would be S1 minus S2 and T1 minus T2. So we just put the sign. It doesn't matter so much because where delta rho appears is a quadratic term. The sign change doesn't matter. We just square, square it in the end. And also since the exchange between the boxes, um, it doesn't matter. The sign of Q doesn't really matter if we flip Q. Um, we get the same flow. I mean, they, where the position of these arrows in this box is, is not particularly meaningful. All right, so I'm going to take the difference of the temperature equations and the difference of the salinity equations. So if I do that, I get the following. data. Here, um, if I take the difference of the two equations, 
that gets rid of the factor of a half. And almost the same thing for the salinity equation. D by dt, S1 minus S2. Here for the freshwater flux, I'll get rid of the half. And the factor of a half on the Q. Now all the terms here depend only on the difference of the salinities or the differences in the temperatures. And the same is true for the, um, uh, the flushing of the water, the flow rate Q. So Q is going to be the sum of a diffusive time scale plus a flushing time scale that depends on the square of the density differences then this can be expressed in terms of the differences in salinities and temperatures. Introduce the variables delta t and delta s. So that our equations will become d by dt of delta t is minus 1 over tr delta t minus theta minus delta t times q and d by dt of delta s is f of t. And it's now useful to introduce um, non-dimensional variables to eliminate some of the, the the multiplicity of parameters in the equation. And so I'm going to introduce a non-dimensional time, t primed, which will just be the t divided by, I'm going to pick the diffusive time scale, td. And so that means that the time derivative, d by dt, is going to be the same thing as d t primed dt times d by dt primed using the chamber rule. And dt prime dt is just 1 over td. And for um, delta t, I'm going to scale that by theta. So delta, or a new variable x, will be delta t divided by theta. Or delta t is going to be just theta times x. And for y, will be my delta s variable, scaled by delta s and divided by delta t over theta. And so delta s will be alpha t theta y divided by alpha s divided by alpha s, sorry. And now I'm going to use these non-dimensional variables, stick them in here to obtain um, dimensionless equations. So if I do that, wherever I see a d by dt, I'm now going to get a 1 over td. So I'll have 1 over td. And then delta t is just theta times x. So I'll have a factor of theta and a d by dt primed of x. And same thing, similar thing, I should say, for this equation. Uh, this will become alpha t theta over alpha s times td times d by dt primed of y. One over tr 
with a minus x minus 1 times theta minus theta x times q. And this equation, I get f of t s naught over h minus delta s is just alpha s. Oh, so I mean alpha t theta divided by alpha s y times q. And q is 1 over td plus q over v. And alpha delta s is just alpha t theta y minus and delta t is just theta x so alpha t theta x all squared so i can pull out a common factor of alpha t theta this becomes 1 over td plus q over v alpha t theta squared times y minus x squared and then dividing through by theta over td in the first equation and replacing derivative respect to t prime by just a dot. I'll have x dot is equal to minus td over tr x minus 1 and the thetas will cancel. This theta will also cancel minus x times td d over td, right, and when I multiply through by td, the tds will become th this td, and this td will just be 1 plus td q over v alpha t theta squared x minus y squared. And y dot will be equal to alpha s td over alpha t beta f of t s naught divided by h minus the alpha t theta alpha s will cancel and I'll be just with td y times um, if I bring the td on the inside I guess I should do that I'll just bring it on the inside td over td plus td q over v alpha t theta squared x minus y all squared And I'm going to define a new non-dimensional parameter, alpha, which will just be the ratio of the diffusive time scale to the relaxation time scale, td over tr. I'm going to define a new parameter, p bar, which will be equal to alpha s td over alpha t beta f bar, so the average of f s naught over h. And finally, the last parameter I'm going to define is mu squared, which will be defined as td q over v times alpha t theta squared. So with these definitions, finally, I think I will get the same equations in the paper by Chessie. And so the equations, the non-dimensional equations are x dot is equal to minus alpha x minus 1 minus x times 1 plus u squared x minus y 
squared. And y dot is equal to p bar plus p prime of t. We're going to look at the case where this is 0. We're going to look at the steady case. Uh, minus y times 1 plus mu squared x minus y squared. And the non-dimensional parameter alpha here, which is the ratio of the diffusive time scale over the relaxation time scale, turns out to be about 3.6 times 10 to the 3. If we choose TD to be about 219 years, and TR to be about 25 days. So there's a quite a fast relaxation time for the temperature, and that's because there's a strong feedback. If the uh, sea surface temperatures are much warmer than the atmosphere, then there's going to be a, a very rapid heat loss from the ocean to the atmosphere. And conversely, if the ocean waters are much colder than the atmosphere, then there'll be a very quick uh, warming of the ocean waters. And so this relaxation time scale is fairly fast. Whereas the diffusive time scale in the ocean, due to mixing and eddies, is, is rather slow. And then mu squared can be thought of as the ratio of TD, the diffusive time scale, over an advective time scale, where T advective time scale is uh, V over Q times 1 over alpha T theta. And this one uh, is estimated in the paper to be about 29 years. And that would give a mu squared of about 7.5. And p bar, the kind of the mean transport precipitation, p bar, after being non-dimensionalized, comes out to about 1. So we're going to explore the behavior of this model, the steady state solutions in particular, but also time stepping it, um, but always for a steady forcing for prescribed p bar. We're going to see um, how it is that this equation, these equations give rise to multiple um, thermohaline equilibrium for the same forcings uh, but different initial conditions how we might end up in different regimes.